Hi, everybody. We're going to give it another minute and then we'll get started here. Okay, since it is 11, I want to make sure we respect everyone's time. Uh, my name is Kelsey Meyer. I'm the Senior Administrative Assistant in the Center for Faculty Excellence. And today we have Leanne speaking to us from the Office of Accessibility Services. Hello, everyone. First, I want to just check and see, is that coming through okay, my screen? Okay, and it's just showing like the actual presentation, no background stuff. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So good morning, everyone. My name is Leanne Kessler, and I'm the Assistant Director of Accessibility Services, and I am very happy to be with you today um, to talk a little bit about our office, um, a little bit about what we do, uh, the students that we work with, and then basically how we partner with everyone on campus um, to make sure that our students with disabilities needs are being met and that they're receiving equal access. Um, it's truly a university-wide shared responsibility to work with the students with disabilities. Um, so we certainly enjoy working with everyone on that. So I'll go ahead and kind of jump right in and get started here. Um, our office is located on the BG campus at 38 College Park Office Building. Um, that's kind of on the north edge of campus for any of you that are, that are new to BGSU. And for any of you that are new to BGSU, welcome. Um, again, we're on the north edge of campus, um, same building as the Counseling Center, which is really nice because a lot of our students utilize the Counseling Center as well. Um, and then we also coordinate services for the Firelands campus as well. So we have an office there that we rotate having staff um, travel there, and that's in 105 George Mylander Hall. Um, we took over services for Firelands, I think it was about five years ago. Um, it's really nice. It's really streamlined the process. We have a lot of students that take classes, like maybe they take BG campus classes, but then pick up an online class through Firelands. So it's really helped make it a much more convenient, um, efficient process for the students. In terms of our staff, um, our director is Peggy Dennis. She is also the university's ADA Section 504 Compliance Officer. Um, she's a Title IX Deputy Coordinator and Supervisor of what's called the National Test Center, which is out of our office. Um, and again, I'm the Assistant Director. Just to give you a little background on myself, I actually uh, started here a little over 20 years ago. Um, I started out as the Graduate Assistant in the office while I was working on my Master's in College Student Personnel. Um, after that, I did that for two years. And then after that, I was hired on full-time as a Student Counselor, uh, then Coordinator for several years, and now the Assistant Director. Um, really enjoy the office, really enjoy the students that we work with, and I'm glad I just started and never left. <laughs> um, so other staff members in our office are Bailey Murphy. She's a coordinator. Um, on her caseload, she has a portion of the undergraduate students, and then she also works with all of our students who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, just to back up a little bit, I have all the grad students on my, my caseload, and then I also have a small portion of the undergrads. Um, our next staff member is Ann Forgrave. She's our accessibility specialist, and she has a very large portion of the undergrad students on her caseload. Um, Lisa Jones is our administrative assistant. Um, she does all kinds of things behind the scenes. Um, we couldn't run without her. So she does a lot of the eligibility packets to the students, um, creating their accommodation memos that they share with their faculty members. Um, also does our books in alternative format for students and all kinds of other tasks. And then one other staff member, um, her name is Jennifer Murray Cosgrove. She's actually with an organization called Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities. They're actually a state agency uh, that works with adults with all different types of disabilities. And they have a newer program called College to Careers where they're trying to connect with college students while they're in college and then help support them when they're looking for their, their full-time employment position. Um, so she's embedded within our office, um, still an OOD employee, but embedded with us. And I have a slide a little bit later in the presentation just to share a little bit more info on that partnership that we have. So in terms of our mission, um, our mission is to provide equal access 
an opportunity to qualified students, faculty, and staff with disabilities. Our goal is to increase awareness of disability issues and support the success of students with disabilities by providing opportunities for full integration into the BGSU community. So there's a couple of words in there that I want to highlight, um, equal access. So a lot of the students, when they come into BG, they had services at the K-12 level. K-12 gov is governed by different laws than we are, and they are charged at that level with ensuring that the student is successful. They are they're guaranteeing that the student is successful. College level, we of course want them to be successful. That's the goal but we're not guaranteeing it. We are looking at their documentation. We're looking at what are their weaknesses? What are the impacts of their disability? What are some things that we can put in place that are reasonable um, to accommodate that student and level the playing field for them and give them a chance to be successful? It's still on them though, to meet the essential course requirements, um, meet the grading standards, everything is, you know, any other student. Um, so I just like to highlight that. And that's something that we really stress with the families as well. Again, the goal is definitely success, um, but what we're, we're charged with providing is equal access, which is a very different thing. Um, one other word that I wanted to highlight in the mission is the word qualified students. A lot of people think that there's a different um, admissions process for our students with disabilities. That's not the case. They go through the same admissions process as any other student, meet the same criteria to get in, and then once they are admitted, then they reach out to our office and request accommodations if they choose to. So I just wanted to show that. So in terms of the services that we provide, we do a bunch of different things. Um, one of our, our main tasks is providing academic and housing accommodations for students with disabilities and chronic health conditions. And again, that's kind of the bulk of what we do. Um, we also provide though employment accommodations for faculty, staff, grad students, and student employees. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, but we do. Um, and there's uh, everything's on our website in terms of application materials, you know, paperwork that we would need to have. Um, and, and primarily that goes through Peggy Dennis, our director. So if any employees themselves need to request accommodations, they're welcome to reach out and start that process. We also do accommodations for visitors who are attending events on campus. So everything that goes out from the university regarding events has a statement on it that lets people know that if they have a disability and they need to request any type of accommodations, they can reach out either to the event provider or to our office and we help coordinate that. Usually for events, we see requests for things like disability parking, um, maybe wheelchair accessible seating available at the event or like sign language interpreters. Those are kind of the main things that we see. And same thing if you're ever hosting an event um, and you get contacted and have questions about how to provide something for a visitor, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. As I mentioned uh, earlier, we do coordinate services for both the BG and the Firelands campuses. And then we are also what's known as the National Test Center for the university. So we do the ACT, the MAT, and the CLEP exams. And again, there's information on our website about that if any students or even non-students need to um, set up appointments to take those exams. And then we do a lot of referrals to other campus resources. So like I mentioned, we have a lot of students that use the Counseling Center, Falcon Health Center, maybe for some medication, um, TRIO, the FLY program, Learning Commons. So that's a lot of what we do is, is finding out from the students, okay, what are their, their needs? And usually they have sort of a wide variety of academic and non-academic needs, and then we help them get connected to those resources. So in terms of the definition of disability, we are governed by what's called the Americans with Disabilities Act. And under that, a person with a disability is a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So when a student submits documentation to us, that's the definition that we're using when we're reviewing documentation to determine if they qualify as having a disability. Um, also, that falls under having a record of such an impairment or regarded as having such an impairment. That's the full definition. And then major life activities are a lot of things. Um, we included a list here. And again, this is not all inclusive, but things like caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, standing, lifting, bending, speaking, breathing. Some of the ones that we are very concerned about in the higher education setting are learning, reading, concentrating, thinking, communicating, and of course, working. 
So again, this is kind of the, what we're looking for is the first step when a student applies for accommodations is do they meet the definition of a disability? And then it kind of goes from there, but that's step one. So in terms of the types of disabilities that our office serves, uh, we work with students with a wide variety of disability types. Um, we've included on the slide some of the ones we see, but again, this is not all inclusive. We really see students with a wide variety things that are sensory. So these could be like visual impairments or blindness, um, students who are hearing impaired or deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, we also have some students with mobility impairments. I think this is a lot of the, the ones people sort of traditionally think of when they think of a student with a disability, students who use like wheelchairs, maybe arm crutches, um, walkers. We have students with cerebral palsy, arth arthritis, prosthetics. Um, the probably the biggest group of students that we have is our students with invisible disabilities. So these are things that are not apparent, um, wouldn't necessarily know it unless the student shares it with you. Um, but these are students with autism, a lot of students with ADD or ADHD, learning disabilities, things like seizure disorders, and then mental health diagnoses. So these are things like anxiety, depression, OCD, personality disorders, bipolar disorders, PTSD, again, a wide variety. And then also a lot of students now with chronic health conditions. So things like diabetes, asthma. We see asthma a lot for like housing related um, requests, like for air conditioning, um, Crohn's disease, like cystic fibrosis, heart conditions, chronic migraines, IBS. And again, this is just a small sort of snapshot of some of the students that we see. We see a lot more diagnoses than these. Um, but again, we're looking for, it's not just the diagnosis, it's looking at, okay, does this rise to the level of being a disability? Does this have an impact on a major life activity? So that's what we're looking for. Um, I like to point out too, that we have a lot of students that have multiple diagnoses. When I started years ago, it was more typical for us to see a student with a single diagnosis. So maybe we had a student that had a learning disability in math and primarily it impacted you know, their, their math classes. That's pretty uncommon now. Most of the students that we see now, you know, 20 plus years later, have multiple diagnoses. So I like to point that out because I think it just helps highlight the students have a lot that they're managing. Um, in addition to being a college student, a lot of different health things. So it's typical now for us to see a student that maybe has autism and ADHD and a learning disability. So. In terms of the prevalence of our disability types, um, I just worked on our, our annual report for 21-22. So this is very recent information. Um, we track our students and you know, make sure that they're doing well um, and they're graduating. And so we have 1,090 students who were registered with our office who completed the spring semester. So we know that there are more that started that unfortunately did not complete. So these are the ones who completed the spring semester. So just about 1100. And of those, our most prevalent disability type is now mental health, psychiatric. So we had 463 or 42% of the students. Um, when we code the students with their disabilities, they don't go under just one group. They can fall under multiple groups based on their multiple diagnoses. So I just wanted to mention that. So they can fall under several of these groups. Um, number two is ADHD, or 28% of our students. And then number three is specific learning disability, 21%. Um, number one, the mental health, that's definitely a huge change from years ago as well. Um, learning disability used to be the most common, ADHD, and then chronic health conditions. And we have seen huge growth in the number of students with mental health conditions. Um, I think for a variety of reasons, I think there's definitely more awareness now that students can get services at the college level, which is good that they're getting registered with us. And then there's just, there's a lot going on in the world nowadays and a lot, I think more people being diagnosed and just, you know, a lot of stressors for the students to deal with. Um, so again, we're seeing a huge increase in that. And it's just something that I think that's good to keep in mind as you're interacting with the students. So again, a little bit more about who are our students. Again, this is from the 21-22 year. Uh, 1,090 students I mentioned completed classes um, for spring semester. Of those 1,090, 892 of them were undergrads on the BG campus. And then we also had 130 graduate students. Um, that number has gone up quite a bit, the grad student number. Um, it used to be under 100 and it keeps creeping up and up. Um, so that's some, another area of growth that we're seeing. 
And then um, Firelands campus, we had 68 students. And then just in general, to put things in perspective, when I started again, 20 plus years ago, um, we had a couple hundred students. We knew every single student. We knew them by name, by face. <laughs> we knew their disability type. Um, and now we're, we're obviously managing a very large caseload of students with disabilities. Um, so it's a lot more detailed note taking <laughs> um, case notes, making sure that, you know, we're keeping track of everything. And, and I just, you know, we have a small staff, but I'm real proud of all the work that we do and the volume of student paperwork that we handle. So in terms of our colleges that our students are enrolled, we have students enrolled in every major on campus. Our most common is arts and sciences, followed by education and then also health. But again, we have students in every program, every major. Um, I already talked about the most common disability types, again, the mental health, ADHD, and LD. The average cumulative GPA of our students with disabilities is 3.22. I like to include that because I think sometimes there's a misperception about students with disabilities and maybe that they're not doing as well academically. Um, don't get me wrong, we certainly have some students um, that you know, don't do well academically, but we also have students that do very well and, and have 4.0s. So I just like to include that, that in general, the students that are using their accommodations that are registered with us, they are doing well academically. Um, the percentage of students that are taking full-time classes is 80%. I like to include that just because we have a lot of students that are taking classes, not a lot, but you know, one in five that are taking them part-time. A lot of times that's related to their disability and different health needs that they have and, and not being able to manage a full-time load. Um, and then again, the number of our students in good standing with a 2.0 or higher is 95%. So we're proud of that. We also track the retention. I don't have the data in here, but we are consistently at or even slightly above the retention rate of the university students as a whole, which we're very proud of. And again, those are the students that are using their accommodations. Those are the ones that are doing the best. All right, so registering with our office, um, it's a student driven process. So the student has to be a, what we call a willing participant um, in the process. K-12 again is a little different. They're responsible for identifying the students, for testing them, making sure that they're you know, progressing and, and succeeding. College level, the student has to choose to want to get registered with us and some do and some don't. Um, they have to self-identify to our office, indicate that they have a disability and that they want to get registered. So in terms of paperwork, there's a request for accommodation form that we have the student complete, and that's where they let us know, okay, here's you know, what I'm interested in requesting from you. A lot of times it's pretty similar to what they had at the high school level. Um, and then they also are responsible for providing us with disability documentation. So this can take many different forms. We have a verification form that they can have their medical provider complete and it asks for pretty basic information, like what's their diagnosis, when were they diagnosed, how were they diagnosed, and then what we're most interested in are what are called their functional limitations. So basically, how does their disability impact them in the educational setting? How does it impact their ability to take tests that are timed? How does it impact their ability to get all the information presented in classes, that kind of thing? And then usually the provider makes some recommendations for us. Um, a lot of the students, again, come out of K-12. They had in place at that level, either an IEP or a 504 plan. It's important to know that that plan ends when the student graduates. Sometimes the students think that that carries into college. It does not. Um, we like to see a copy of it just to see what they had in place in the past, but we also need additional documentation. So typically for an IEP, they would have what's called an evaluation team report or an ETR. And this is where the school psychologist would have done like IQ and achievement testing, like a full evaluation on the student. So that's what we need to see. And we need that to be pretty recent, age appropriate, ideally done at the adult level. So age 16 or later, so it's very current. Um, and then depending on what their 504 plan is for, there might be some stuff from the high school they can give to us, or again, that verification form being filled out by their provider or some other medical records. So again, all of the students um, have the responsibility to do this. They submit the request, they submit the supporting documentation, and then we review it. So again, it's not an automatic transfer of services from high school to college. They have to initiate the process, submit paperwork to us, and again, we determine what are called reasonable college level accommodations. 
So sometimes we see that things were in place at the K-12 level that we wouldn't consider reasonable at the college level. For example, maybe a student had some weaknesses with writing and in K-12 they decided, okay, instead of writing a five page paper like the rest of the class, the student with a disability writes a two page paper instead. We would not consider that reasonable at the college level. We wanna make sure the student is held to the same standards as every other student same grading standards, same assignments, all that kind of stuff. So we, that's a, a common conversation that we have with families when talking about differences from high school to college and just making sure that they have a um, accurate picture of what it's gonna be like at the college level. So again, it's individualized for every student, not cookie cutter at all. It's very dependent upon their documentation and what their specific weaknesses are. And then once we decide, yes, they have a disability, yes, we can put some accommodations in place, we generate what is called an accommodation letter. Um, I like to explain it to the students as this letter is basically the college version of an IEP or a 504 plan that you had in high school. So what we do is we give the student a letter, we share it with them electronically, and we ask them to save it on their computer and then they are instructed to share that letter with faculty within the first few weeks of the semester. Ideally, the first week is what we, we tell them to do. Um, if it's an in-person class, we want them to print paper copies of it and then schedule a meeting with the professors during their office hours. Um, and if it's a, an online class, we indicate that they can share the letter electronically. So again, students are instructed to do that first few weeks of the semester well in advance of any tests or any time, you know, anything that they'll need an accommodation for. Um, there is no deadline for applying for services though. So we let students know, some will decide, I wanna try things on my own first to see how it goes. And then, you know, they decide later they want to get registered and that's certainly fine, but accommodations are not provided retroactively. So we don't go back in time and take care of things that have already happened. Same thing as if a student is approved for accommodations, maybe for an exam, they decide, okay, I wanna try this exam. I don't wanna use my accommodations. We let them know you can choose to do that. Again, you're an adult at your choice, but if you don't do well on it, we can't go back in time and let you retake that exam. So our, our you know, philosophy, and we certainly encourage the students to get registered from the very beginning, use their accommodations regularly. So again, the accommodations begin when the letter is shared with the professors. Um, everything in the letter is confidential. So we ask that faculty don't share that information with anyone else. Um, there's nothing in there about disability type. We don't ever include that. Um, that's up to the student to decide if they want to share any details about their disability type but faculty can be assured that we have that information on file in our office, it's kept confidentially and they have definitely gone through the whole process and, and be, to become approved for services. Um, and then these accommodations are good for use all the way through graduation. That's another difference from K-12. They have to have a meeting every year, they have a reevaluation every three years. College is a little different, I, I think a little nicer, um, just in terms of once they get registered, it's set for their whole time here. A lot of students are, are happy to hear that when they come into college. So. so what are some of the accommodations that we can do? Um, these are some of the most typical ones that we approve. A student can request anything. Um, we, we can review for it and determine if it's reasonable, but there are sort of you know, a standard set of accommodations that are widely accepted as reasonable at the college level. So things like extended time for exams and quizzes, we can do like time and a half, or if there's a pretty substantial impairment, we can even go up to double time. Um, and that would be for any timed in class or online exams. We also do like a testing environment with limited distractions. We have some students that struggle in the classroom setting and need to have a quieter space to take their exams in to be able to focus. We also do exams in audio format or, or read aloud, so typically for students with a visual impairment, um, or maybe they have a learning disability in the area of reading, that's pretty common. Um, also a computer for exams, that could be again for a, a variety of reasons. We have some students that are able to physically get to classes, but really struggle with sort of being present. Maybe they're having a flare up of symptoms, don't feel the best, but they got there. Um, so we have some accommodations for making sure that they're getting all the info presented in class. So some of the students will take a recorder in, record the lectures and discussions. Um, that way they can go back to it later, make sure they're getting all the info. 
And then we also do some note taking assistance where we help the student get a, a copy of notes from the professor if available or from another volunteer peer student in the class. Um, another pretty typical thing is calculator. Um, again, if they have like a learning disability in the area of math, um, that might be something that we approve as an accommodation. We can do extensions of due dates when assignments are given with very little notice. Um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of students with chronic health conditions that sometimes they're going along doing fine and then all of a sudden they'll have a flare up of their condition. Um, if that happens when something is sort of assigned, you know, spur of the moment to do like within the next few days, we can help them get an extension if they're having a flare up. Otherwise, if it's something that's already on the syllabus from the beginning of the semester, we let the student know that's up to each individual professor. Um, so we encourage the student to work ahead when they're feeling well, you know, meet those deadlines. If they run into a difficult situation to reach out to the professor and that's up to, up to the professors. So we also do alternative formatted books. Um, same thing, usually for students with visual impairments or with a learning disability in the area of reading. A lot of the students need to be able to listen to the information at the same time that they're reading and that helps them understand everything better. And then also for some students with chronic health conditions, break strain classes needed, or even for mental health. We have some students that really struggle with anxiety, um, sometimes get a little overwhelmed in class, maybe need to step out for just a couple of minutes, um, use some of their, their coping strategies, calm down a little bit and then come back into the classroom setting. So again, these are just some, some typical things that we approve. Um, we also do housing accommodations. Um, so this, again, could be a wide variety of things, but it could be things like single rooms, um, air conditioning, like HEPA filters. Maybe the student has like IBS or Crohn's disease, needs access to a semi-private bathroom. Um, also for our wheelchair users, we do things like grip bars in the bathroom, in the shower, like roll-in showers, um, lowered peepholes, closet bars that kind of thing, and then emotional support animals. That's a newer thing um, that we provide. And actually later in the presentation, I have a little section on animals on campus because we typically get a lot of questions about animals. Um, we also do dining accommodations. So we work closely with the campus dietitian, and this would be any students that have food allergies or medically required diets. So one of the ways that we wanna, I guess we ask for some assistance from faculty is in providing a syllabus statement. Um, we're involved in all kinds of preview days, Falcon Fridays, all kinds of events. So usually students know about us um, and know to submit documentation, but occasionally a student doesn't find out about our office until they're in a class and they're reading through the syllabus and they realize, oh, hey, there's an accessibility services office on campus. So we just, ask that you, you know, please provide that in your syllabus. And this is, was list, lifted off of our website. You're welcome to use the exact same statement or something very similar. Um, but the biggest thing is just if a student reaches out to a professor and says, hey, um, you know, I, if they use the words like IEP 504, or, you know, disability, just make sure that they are getting connected with our office. Um, and that you're not required. Um, and really we don't encourage that you provide anything until you have a letter from our office. So just make sure that you refer the student to us and then we can take it from there in terms of letting them know what paperwork we're gonna need. So in terms of test taking accommodations, that's another area that we ask for some assistance from faculty. Um, if an accommodation memo is provided to a faculty member, you can be assured that those accommodations have been approved as necessary for that student um, if there's ever a concern with a specific accommodation, we ask that you don't just like deny something. We ask that you reach out to us and talk through, you know, what the concern is um, and get just a consultation about that. Um, in terms of the exam accommodations, though, we do ask faculty or their department staff to provide the, the more common exam accommodations. So this would be like the extra time, the testing environment with limited distractions. If, however, a student is eligible for extensive exam accommodations, then occasional arrangements may be made with our office. So typically things that rise to the level of extensive would be maybe the student needs a reader, so somebody to read the exam out loud to them. Maybe they need a scribe. So something that involves some type of like other human intervention to provide the accommodation. And again, if you're not sure, you can always reach out to us. And then we just ask that these arrangements are made with sufficient notice by calling our office in advance. Um, 
Oh, and I think we had a couple people signed up that are at Firelands. Firelands faculty, same thing, are welcome to provide the accommodations on their own, or they have a university-wide test center that they're welcome to utilize called the Teaching and Learning Center, the TLC. All right, so the CFE obviously is hosting the presentation today. They're a really good partner for us as well and just wanted to include some information. Um, they provide lots of resources on their website about web accessibility, multimedia accessibility, making online learning accessible for students with disabilities, lots of workshops offered throughout the year. Um, so they're just a really good partner for us. We're the office that you know, knows and lets people know this has to be done and they handle a lot of the tech pieces for us and making sure that the faculty know how to provide accessible materials to the students. And then one thing I wanted to mention, hopefully you guys have heard about this, Ally, it's a digital content accessibility tool. This is available to all university faculty and it helps make the course materials more accessible. So it integrates within Canvas and it gives files an accessibility score and gives instructions for how to make the, the materials accessible. On the student end, it allows the student to select multiple formats to download resources. So it's usually, I think it's up in the upper right-hand corner, it's alternative formats, the students can go in and if it's a like non-readable file, they can go in and, and change it to like an audio format, something readable in case they're using like screen reader software or you know, reader software. Um, and again, CFE offers a lot of workshops regarding Ally. So on our end, we make sure the students know about this and help them navigate Canvas and how to get to these materials for the students that are qualified for it. And then we also have just a lot of students that this is helpful for. This is just sort of their, their learning style preference. So this is helpful for, for many different students. All right, so I mentioned earlier that we have a partnership in place with OOD, which is again, Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities. Um, they used to be known as BVR, the Bureau of Vocational Rehabilitation. Some people might know them by that name. Um, but again, they are a state agency and they have a partnership with Ohio State College and University System, the Ohio Department of Higher Education, businesses, um, and OOD. And again, they're offering support for students with disabilities as they prepare for their careers. So they provide different services for everyone, very dependent upon you know, what they're going into, what their needs are, but they do a lot of career exploration, they do counseling, a lot of resume development, um, like practice um, for interviewing, internship preparation, assistive technology, just a lot of good different things. So they've been with us now a few years now. Again, Jennifer is our counselor here at BGSU. And so we've been getting a lot of our students connected to her for support while they're here as a student. And then again, support as they're, they're graduating and finding their, their post um, college employment. So. All right, so I want to switch gears a little bit. Like I mentioned, we get a lot of questions about animals on campus. So I wanted to just include some general information that I thought would be helpful. Um, service animals, I'll cover first. These are defined by the ADA as dogs or miniature horses, but primarily dogs for a college campus who are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities. So the work or the task that the dog does must be directly related to the handler's disability. And some examples of this would include like assisting individuals who are blind or have low vision, navigation, other tasks. I think that's probably the one that most people think of when they think of a service dog that would be a guide dog. Um, but there are dogs that do all kinds of other work as well for students with different types of disabilities. We have some that alert individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing, either to the presence of people or sounds. Um, we have dogs that do uh, nonviolent protection or rescue work. Maybe students that have a dog that helps pull their wheelchair or help them retrieve items that they drop. Um, we have some dogs that can assist an individual during a seizure. Um, ones that alert individuals to the presence of allergens. Um, we had several years ago a student that had a dog that had a severe peanut allergy that was airborne. And so they had a dog that was able to detect peanut like in the air and would alert the individual. Um, again, retrieving items such as medicine, telephone, dropped items, that kind of thing. And then some dogs that provide physical support or assistance, maybe for a student who has um, you know, issues with like balance, stability, 
those are typically larger dogs then that provide that kind of work for students. So in terms of etiquette with service animals, we just ask that if you, you know, are ever around an individual with a service animal that you don't pet it. Um, I think that's pretty common. People know that, but it, it, sometimes we're surprised. Um, the, the animal's working um, and, and anything that people are doing, petting the animal, distracting the animal, it can be a safety issue for the person with the disability. Um, so again, we ask that, that you not, and that if you see students in class, you know, trying to pet a service animal, maybe that you help address that as well. Um, also, we ask that individuals never feed someone service animal. A lot of the dogs are on very strict diets and they are trained to relieve at certain times of the day so that they can sit with the student in class for a couple hours and not have to you know, exit the classroom. So that's important. And then I like people to know that there are two questions that we are allowed to ask a person that presents with a service animal, either like in class or in their office. Um, number one, is the animal required because of a disability? And then assuming that the answer is yes. Number two is what work or task has the animal been trained to perform? So these again are the only two questions that anyone on campus is allowed to ask, including our office. This is one of the, the few areas that we can't ask for documentation. We can't ask for them to demonstrate the tasks. These are the two questions. Um, and actually the students with disabilities that have service animals, they're not even required to be registered with our office. So sometimes we know about these students because they have other needs and sometimes we do not. So again, there's no license, certification, any sort of identifying gear that's required for the dog. Some students choose to have the dog wear like a vest or something that identifies them as, as a service dog, but that's not required. Um, and again, there's no approval process with our office. So we have a lot of times people will reach out to us and say, hey, I have the student in my class. They have, you know, they say they have a service dog. Like, can I just verify that? And again, if we've had contact, because of something else, or if they just happen to disclose this to us, we can share some information, um, but we may not be aware of everybody on campus that has a service animal. Uh, service dogs are permitted to safely accompany a person in any public space, unless the dog's presence would compromise a sterile environment or otherwise fundamentally alter the nature of the service program or activity. Again, if there are concerns about this, please reach out to our office. We're happy to have a conversation and talk through you know, what the concern is. And then if you ever witness any concerning behavior with a service animal, that can be reported to the Dean of Students Office and is treated as a conduct issue. Um, we have our policy online, so I encourage everybody to at least skim through it and be familiar with it. And then on the link off of the faculty staff page, there's also a nice Q&A and it has those two questions listed as well that the people are allowed to ask. So in contrast to service animals, we also have some emotional support animals on campus. They can also be referred to as assistance animals, and these can be a variety of animals. So on campus here, we see a lot of dogs, we have a lot of cats, um, we have some birds, guinea pigs, rabbits, hamsters, um, again, a wide variety. Typically smaller, quieter <laughs> animals is what we see. Um, for, for the requests. Um, these animals provide emotional support and companionship to individuals with disabilities. These are not covered by the ADA and they can be approved by our office though as an accommodation and on-campus housing. So these animals, if we approve it, the student goes through the housing accommodation request process like any other student, they submit a request. We have them type up a personal statement talking about their symptoms, the frequency, severity of their symptoms, and then how would having this animal present help alleviate those symptoms. And then there's documentation that they're required to provide um, by their you know, medical doctor, psychologist, counselor, therapist, it kind of just depends. Um, but they go through that whole process. And then those animals are approved for use in their room only in, in the housing setting and they're not allowed to go in any of the public places on campus, like a dining hall, classrooms, rec center, anything like that. Um, we do have a service and, and emotional support animal exercise yard um, on campus. It's actually just on the north side of our building. So it's a fenced in yard that students are welcome to come use um, to give their animals some exercise. Typically it's for dogs. Um, occasionally we see another animal in there as well, like on a leash, it's kind of funny. Um, but they're certainly welcome to come use that and let the animals run around and, you know, have a nice place 
to, to play on campus. So um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that we do offer some disability etiquette trainings. We offer these once a month. Um, a lot of the information is similar to what I presented today, but there's some other information as well. So if you're interested in learning more about disability regulations, um, if you're in a position where you do a lot of event planning and want more information on like public requests for accommodations, again, more information on students, what your rights and responsibilities are at the university, this would be a good thing for either you or another person you know um, to sign up for. Open to everybody, faculty, staff, grad students, students, again, once a month. Right now they're virtually, um, so you just log in, listen to the presentation, and then there's time for questions at the end, and they're typically about 50 minutes long. So just wanted to share that. And then just again, our contact information, um, BG campus, we're in 38 College Park office building. Our email is access, so A-C-C-E-S-S -S at bgsu.edu, and then our phone number and fax number. So that's the information I thought would be helpful. Obviously there's plenty of time for questions. I ask if there are any like specific questions either to like a person's own situation or to a specific student that you reach out privately for that. But if there are general questions, I'm certainly happy to answer any of those. Surprised there's no questions. <laughs> I doubt that I covered everything. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, Leanne. Hi, hey. Kelsey. Um, I have a question actually about the Ally um, software in Canvas. Um, and I was wondering if uh, CFE has trainings on how to use Ally specifically the faculty could go to? So we don't have a specific ally training. We have our introduction to Canvas training, but let me follow up with uh, Holly, who is our uh, person who works with Canvas as our instructional designer, and I'll see if she has any information about ally trainings or anything like that. That would be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, I see a question came through the chat here. Thank you very much. Could you give more details on how an audio exam would look like? So if a student needs their exams in audio format, um, it depends on if it's an in-person class or if it's an online exam. So for an online exam, we ask that the exam be offered outside of Lockdown Browser because Lockdown Browser conflicts with the reader software that the students use. So typically we have faculty provide it online, remove the lockdown, the student on their own uses their reader software to have the questions read out loud by the computer. And then typically it's proctored through like a Zoom um, meeting instead of like through the lockdown browser. If it's an in-person class and a paper test, um, the student, like the faculty member is either, you know, welcome to provide that, you know, like during their office hours, they could read the exam to the student, or they could make arrangements, like I said, with our office, provide us typically with an electronic copy, and then same thing, we would have the student sit at a computer, have the computer read the questions out loud, but that way it's in a proctored setting. So I don't know if that answers the question exactly or not, I hope so. <laughs>
<laughs> Anything else that anybody has questions about? I have included in the chat here a link to the workshop feedback form if attendees could take a few minutes to fill that out. I'll also send that along with a copy of the slides in an email so you will have access to this information um, after the workshop is over. There aren't any other questions. I guess we could end a little early and give everyone 15 minutes back in their day, if that's okay with you, Leanne. That's fine with me. Yeah. And like I said, if anybody has any additional questions, feel free to reach out to us anytime. We're happy to have conversations and really appreciate um, just the collaboration on, and again, providing supports and services for our students with disabilities. Thank you guys so much and uh, enjoy your weekend since it's Friday. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.